Hey everybody, some gadget guy here, somegadgetguy.com, and we've heard a lot about how smartphone cameras are improving, how the adoption of smartphones has largely killed off the entry and mid-level point-and-shoot markets for most customer demographics. The convenience factor plays a huge part in that, and you'll almost always have your phone on you while taking a camera means carrying additional weight and bulk, combined with the fact that most phone cameras are now, air quotes, good enough for our day-to-day snapshotty pics, it's not hard to see why consumers are embracing them as solutions for mobile photography. Many people are even starting to compare the output they get from their phones to higher-end point-and-shoots and even SLRs. And that got me curious to test out one of the most critical features of our cameras, namely depth of field. How pleasantly do our smartphones blur the background of our pictures while keeping the subject of our photo in focus? This is largely a feature of sensor size, and all apertures being equal, the larger the sensor, the more shallow your depth of field. The major advantage of SLRs is their humongous sensor size. The sensor on the iPhone 5S and low-end point-and-shoot cameras is about half the size of my pinky nail, whereas the sensor on my 7D is about the size of a postage stamp. With the right lens, it can achieve fetishistically shallow depth of field. That makes the difference between an ultra-low-light shot looking kind of blurry here at an aperture of f8 and looking downright scary when the lens is wide open at f1.4. So I wanted to test indoors and outdoors to see how our phones compare to each other and to traditional photography solutions. As this is a function of sensor size and optics, I've opted to shoot video instead of stills, so we don't get hung up on things like crops, pixel peeping, and resolution. Everyone will be shooting at 1080p. Our participants for this shootout in order of sensor size and starting at the small end, working larger, the iPhone 5S, the Galaxy S4, the HTC One, and the LG Optimus G Pro all feature a one-third inch sensor with about a six millimeter diagonal. Moving up the chain, the Samsung Galaxy camera sports a one over 2.3 inch sensor, which is almost eight millimeters on the diagonal. Though this camera does have the slowest aperture of the bunch with a maximum iris of f2.8. Next up, the monster Lumia 1020 sports a two third inch sensor besting the Galaxy camera for an 11 millimeter diagonal. And lastly, the 7D will be used as a control to show what APS-C is capable with its 26 millimeter diagonal image sensor and an ultra fast 50 millimeter f1.4 lens. Let's start with a bright outdoor scene. No surprise that the 7D is able to completely blur out the whole frame when focused on this fire hydrant. But moving from f1.4 to a smaller aperture like f8, we're able to see more detail in the background. What is a little surprising is the performance of all of the smaller sensor phones. We hear a lot about large apertures and low light capabilities on smartphones, f2.2, a fast f2.0, even some phones coming out with f1.9 and wider apertures. And while it might actually help shutter speed in low light situations, these wide smartphone apertures don't seem to do much in the way of blurring out the background of a scene. Regardless of what the actual lens aperture is, sensor size makes more of a difference. This is a touch more noticeable moving up to the Galaxy camera's larger sensor. And again, another subtle bump up when we move to the Lumia 1020. But even the Lumia with its two third inch sensor and f2.2 aperture isn't quite able to compete against the SLR at f8. Moving into a more controlled environment, again, we'll start off with the 7D at f1.4 and now at f8. The more normal phone cameras all play very similarly, so similarly, in fact, that I have a hard time not focusing on other aspects of the image, like white balance, contrast, color saturation, how wide the lens is, and exposure. There's almost no difference between these cameras when it comes to depth of field. Like our outdoor test, we see a bump from the Galaxy camera, especially noticeable with the slinky in the background. And again, another subtle bump with the Lumia. Again, it gets close to the blur of the 7D at f8, but it doesn't quite soften the background as much as the SLR can. For anyone who might be claiming that our phones can now unseat large sensor cameras like SLRs, well, that's obviously nonsense. But what we can take away from a test like this is how far our smartphones have come in delivering photographic stills and cinematic video compared to standalone point and shoot cameras. Even compared to the smaller sensor sizes, phone output is incredibly similar to camera output in most shooting scenarios. Not to mention our phones are far more flexible in editing and sending our photos to various services online. Maybe the only reason to continue with a standalone point and shoot photography solution might be those who require a longer mechanical zoom. 
Your photos and videos won't necessarily look any better, but you'll have more flexibility with how far away you can shoot. And it simply needs to be reiterated just how startlingly good the sensor lens combo is on the Lumia 1020. In the right hands, it's very likely you'll be able to best the output of most inexpensive and mid-range point-and-shoot solutions. However, for those of you wanting that really blurry background look from your phone pics, you'll still probably need to rely on things like Instagram filters for a long while yet. As always, folks, thanks for watching, thanks for sharing my videos, and I'll catch you all on the next review.